of jokes. Um, but I have to tell you, there are three of us here from Waldo, so that's more than usual. My wife, Nancy, is here as well, and when they had the little town gathering, like most of you, your towns do, was trying to create a community festival, it wasn't too bad to come up with a t-shirt, too. Uh, here's Waldo. Uh, but we're old enough, so we remember the Where's Waldo stories. Yeah. It's nice to be here with you folks. It's nice to have a chance to come visit. Uh, Nancy and I just came up from the State Fair Convention where there are about 500 people celebrating the 100th anniversary of the State Fair Association. And it just, it just brings to mind how, how big and diverse and wide spectrum Maine agriculture is. And, and uh, the Congressman Pegri kind of alluded to that as well. And it, it is an honor for all of us to have a chance to be associated in some way with the things that you do in your enterprises and in your markets, uh, whether it's something that you, you know, you've, you've uh, taken up as a change or something you're trying to do as a person entering the business or have, have been at it for generations, there's a commonality to all of us um, and, and a commonality that spans generations. Uh, I'm pleased to have a chance to say a few words to interrupt your program as you go along. Uh, and I just want to take a second to, to, to thank Congresswoman Pengry. Is that enough times? Can I say Shelly from this point on? Yeah, okay. Uh, Shelly and I had the opportunity uh, to represent some of the same earth when we were in the, uh, in the state house. She was a state senator for those towns of Morrow, where she had lived at one point in Lincolnville and Owlsboro and so and so did I, and, and you know, I think she had a little more interest in sheep than I did, but I, you know, sheep and dairy and all of, all of which is Maine, and we talk Guernsey cattle from time to time, and, and talk about Maine agriculture, and she's restored uh, to the U.S. Congress the tradition that had gone on for what may have been a century for someone from the state of Maine serving on the U.S. House of Representatives Agriculture Committee, and I saw, as Ned, Ned Potter is here. He served as the last Maine congressman, uh, former Governor Baldacci, who, who was on the Agriculture Committee as well. And he had gone back to Clifford McIntyre and many, many others. So I, I, we're extremely fortunate that Shelley is, is willing to, to serve the broad interests of Maine agriculture and, of course, everybody else's agriculture, but we're especially interested in ours. We had a little bit of an opportunity and have for several years to have uh, to be in Washington to be working on behalf of legislation that tries to to uh, change the way prices are established for for milk for main dairy farming interests and, and Shelley's been a big part of our effort I guess you can call it that our our attempts to to sort of move the the giant boulders that that are I don't think devious by design but always seem to be in the way of helping what we view as local farmers progress and receive a price that's reflective of what uh, milk is worth. Uh, Maine has an outstanding program at the state level to try to support uh, dairy farming. I know Ned was there when it was put together here in, at the state. I was not. Um, so I, you know, for its good parts and bad and mostly good, it's, it's probably allowed a dairy industry to survive in Maine when market forces would have moved it elsewhere. And as, as Shelley noted, I mean, there certainly has been a shift in agricultural policy nationally um, for reasons, you know, we traded things, I guess, and they won or something like that in terms of policy that's moved west. But we, working with her, working with other influential individuals, the Senator from Michigan, that I know she works with now, the, now the Senate Chair of the Ag Committee, um, and certainly the Senior Member of the Ag Committee, Senator Leahy from Vermont, who was successful in negotiating in previous farm bills uh, some attention to the Northeast and creating specialty crop grants, which is something that does impact those of you who are producers in market garden and other commodities away from you know the sort of corn, wheat, soybeans, cotton, rice, the things that they get a lot of help, shall we say. And, and now it seems like you're making a progression away from the big commodities, or at least in the, in the fight. It is a great mix in Maine, and Maine is in such a unique place uh, uh, because we're both big and little. I, I know Deb described our farm. To some, it seems big, but in the, in the global scheme of things, we're, we're small. My parents started with five cows. Um, 
And as you continue to stay there and make investments and survive in the marketplace, um, you know, we've grown to some extent, but I think my daughters, one having worked in farmers markets outside of New York City, understands that market and I'm sure our farm will evolve uh, in, in a direction, in that kind of direction. Um, but it's not easy, and I understand even in the farmers market world, as my daughter saw outside of New York City, it, it's becoming so competitive and they're, 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 you know, we need to grow the marketing opportunities as you're growing your products. Uh, because, you know, you, you do, in every marketplace, you serve a limited clientele. And, uh, and that's, I, I recognize one of your challenges um, going down the road. Well, I'm now on the other side of the table, in a sense, from being the producer and the legislator, and now we're on the regulatory side. And it's certainly an education, uh, most of it beneficial. Um, beneficial to know a little bit more about perhaps how the world really works. Uh, we found ourselves squarely in the middle of the raw milk debate, and and it's been been fascinating for me because I participated in uh, our family has for generations actually selling animals to folks who have wanted to start small, who have become you know perhaps what some would describe as a homestead type, and have a great deal of sympathy with those and tried to help, I think, those people begin and, and sell their products, but have had an opportunity to see from the regulatory side the challenges of wanting to be helpful regulators. And I think Maine has tried very carefully to position itself that way, both through the statutory process as well as what I think the regulators try to do. And that's certainly come to the forefront in the raw milk debate. Most would view Maine, and I know a number of you in this room, as being very, very supportive of trying to do a nominal licensing process that, that ensures some level of food safety and some level of support and some level of protection for the public. And other states, there have been, uh, I think, a, a far more harsh approach to the subject. Uh, and, and I thank you, those of you in this room particularly, who have, who have stepped up in support of what the state tries to do to create a licensing process. And we provide a great deal of public support for those folks who do get licensed in the raw milk area. And, um, and you need to understand that <clears throat> there are those who have gotten sick from raw milk in Maine and there's been no attempt to publicize that even in the last year, but simply go ahead and solve the problem, find the parasites that are being transferred from the farmer to the milk to the consumer and take care of the problem. And that's what raw milk licensure has allowed us to do in this state without a lot of fanfare. And, and that's really how it should work. From the regulatory side, we see all sides. Um, I know there's a lot of a lot of uh, big versus small. We try to kind of cut across the middle. You know, one of our veterinarians uh, mentioned to us yeah, at the Department of Agriculture mentioned to us last yesterday that the, the one of the last meat calls, most recent meat recalls in the state of Maine was not the one that you saw in the newspaper, but was a small producer who was tested and found to have our antibiotics in one meat source. And it was somebody, as is most food recall issues, who had made a mistake, had medicated feed to an animal, and it was caught <clears throat> before it got into the marketplace. And that's the reason we have a regulated process and an inspection process. And we know you participate in that, and, and, and we all ensure consumer protection from that. So I know those who, are, who, who sometimes challenge that, and certainly challenge the government process is what it's all about, right, Ned? those of you who serve there, but perhaps it helps for more of you to understand what, what happens on the other side of the coin. And there's some, I think some tremendous people in the Department of Agriculture, like Dr. Henrietta Buffet and Dr. Honig and others, who, who work hand in hand with producers, but also have the regulatory role, um, irregardless of size. Some of, the, some of the efficiencies of the larger operations uh, are, are, cannot be denied in one sense. Um, and, and in fact, probably have quality that far exceeds other producers. And so we try to cut across the line in terms of size and, and focus on, on making sure everybody meets a minimum quality level. School nutrition thing, who could not get excited about what's happening in our school systems? And I know uh, Shelley and Aaron and the rest of you have, have participated in that. And Senator Collins was describing in glowing terms that she was defending the lowly main potato that she was so proud of seeing some of the school nutrition folks 
who went from Maine and went to Washington and made the just compelling arguments about why we need not only locally grown products, but why we need to be serving them and preparing them in the, uh, in the school cafeterias instead of taking it out of the box. And so I think we're all matching down the same path on that, on that front, obviously with the limitations of funding and other challenges, and food safety challenges too. Um, I want to emphasize to, to all of you that we're here as part of a bigger process to promote Maine, both in wherever you do the work. Um, we're having kind of an argument with the state fair people, even as we speak. I left Portland for a little while because they kind of want more help than somebody else. And I think John Hacker and and the, the rest of the Department of Agriculture staff are challenged every day to think about how we make the maximum amount of import, no matter whether it's working with farmers markets or those people that were in the state fairs or those who are direct producers or ag, ag in the classroom or any other structure, there is less funding to do more things. And that's where we're all challenged in government policy to figure out the best way to provide support for the industry to perform our regulatory functions and still um, advance what we think is a great opportunity. Maine agriculture produces a tremendous diversity of products at the large and small scale. And when we say local, I try to temper that because, because local means as far as you have to go to sell the products you produce on your farm, no matter what it is you produce. If you produce lettuce outside of, outside of uh, you know, Freeport and you can sell it all in Freeport, you know, more power to you. But in the main wild blueberries, we have to go to China to get rid of them all. We have to sell them around the world. And so temper our local, be positive about what we do local, but don't try to be disparaging about what other folks do. I mean, that's really why we try to come down. I mean, I could eat 68 pounds of blueberries every year in Maine, and if everybody else did, we wouldn't have to sell any outside the state. <laughs> I'm going to say what it would do to my, my health, but it would be great, actually, better than some of the other things I eat. Um, and, and, we, and we constantly want to be thinking about the ways we can do it better. We were just doing statistical stuff on people who were with my comments, Ned, about what's going to be at the state fair you know, speech tonight. We grow 3,000% more barley in Maine than we can eat, than the Maine consumers eat. And we probably eat none of it because it goes to Canada for a livestock feed. Therein lies our challenge. We, Northern Maine produces more food than those of you who aren't from Aristic can imagine uh, in so many commodities that we think we don't produce any from. Canola. You know, or we have, we have 30,000 acres of grain in northern Maine, and most of it goes right over the border. So we have some huge opportunities and some huge challenges, and I know the organic dairy guys have been trying to figure out how to access some of those organic grains. Um, well, therein lies the opportunity. Uh, therein lies where I think we can find common ground uh, in terms of wanting to promote Maine products to Maine people. When someone like Moak, who comes in and buys the DeCosta egg farm with a, with a huge reputation to protect from their side their division of land to lake, they're very anxious to get Maine farmers producing grain corn. So you better be careful with all this subsidy discussion, right? If we're going to do that. Yeah, well, I don't think so. <laughs> Deb's pulling the curtain on me here. <laughs> Only people from Waldo can treat each other that way, right? <laughs> Probably my wife wrote it, actually. <laughs> we get excited talking about Maine agriculture, and I think that that's part of why we do the jobs that we do, whether we serve in the Ag Committee or in the Maine Department of Agriculture. So if this is enough of an interruption to your program, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you for the participation and for uh, calling in once in a while. If you don't think we do it just right, please tell us. Uh, we'll, uh, we're very open for comment. Thank you very much.